Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining me and uh, the Minister of Finance and President of the Treasury Board and our Deputy Minister of uh, Finance, Donna Brewer, at the uh, Provincial 2015-16 Physical and Economic Update for Newfoundland and Labrador. We have been saying for quite some time that our province is at a critical juncture. And at no other time has it been more important for us to get our province back on track. This has never been truer than it is today. We know that we can't move forward until we understand where things stand. And that's why today we've asked you to join us here. The information that we will share with you today around the financial state of our and, and affairs of our province was information or is information that had not been shared with you previously. And as your new government, we are now privy to information, to this information, it is important that we share it with you as soon as possible. Our province is facing a, an extremely difficult fiscal reality. Understanding this new reality, correcting the course and moving forward with stronger fiscal management is my government's top priority. A process that starts with acknowledging what the baseline truly is, and this information will be shared with you today. So then we take the next weeks and months ahead, leading into budget 2016, 2017, to have a meaningful dialogue and, and engage with key stakeholders and the public around better long-term planning for greater sustainability for our province. And following through on these plans in a focused and a disciplined way. So when we take on the biggest issues and implement the greatest opportunities in our province, we will take them on together. Our cabinet met earlier today to discuss this important matter. We've also briefed our caucus and the deputy ministers this morning. Information was also shared in advance with the opposition parties, with media and stakeholders from business, labor, and not profit sectors. We are also live streaming today. This, uh, this uh, mid-year fiscal update is being live streamed so that residents from all across the province have an equal opportunity to receive the same information at the same time. The people of Newfoundland and Labrador can expect this kind of openness and accessibility as we continue to deliver the change we need to move beyond today's challenges and focus on a stronger future. We make commitments to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. These are commitments we intend to keep over the course of our mandate. Last week we cancelled the clawback of pension repayments to seniors who were overpaid through no fault of their own. And yesterday we announced a review of the Muskrat <coughs> Falls project cost and schedule, including the identification of any critical risks, which delivers a course on another of our platform priorities to open the books on Muskrat Falls. Our government will deliver on the mandate given to us by the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Minister Bennett will walk through the current fiscal and economic conditions facing the province. And as she does, you will see that the status quo is just not an option. And while we can't do anything about the choices made over the past several years that led us to where we are today, we can take steps to stabilize our future. In fact, we have a responsibility to do so. On slide two, you will notice that our revised deficit projection for the current fiscal year alone is almost $2 billion. In 2015-2016, it was forecasted to be $1.1 billion, so this is actually $870 million higher than it was on, on budget day. This is the information that I asked to be released on September the 28th. And this new deficit projection, along with the updated projections over the next, next five years, is the new reality for our province. So it's our baseline. So it's important we take the time today to walk through this in detail. So from there, we can get 
start and begin the public dialogue on correcting the course, bring in more prudent management of our resources and growing our economy. This is a pivotal time for our province and for our people. While there are certain ch challenges today, there are significant opportunities when we work together. And I have every confidence that by making the right decisions today, we can achieve great things together. But every journey starts with a starting point. And that begins here today with the new details of this fiscal reality. So before I turn things over to <coughs> Minister Bennett, I will say that it's one week for the minister on the job. She's had an extremely busy job. She's been digging into these details. She's been in Ottawa, and I was so proud to see her on that stage yesterday representing our province. And uh, I know she got in town real early this morning and uh, back into work today and here today prepared to uh, walk us through the uh, current fiscal reality. So, Minister Bennett. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Premier Ball. This is indeed a pivotal time for our province. And as the Premier just said, it is important that our government <coughs> provides information as part of this fiscal update that is open and transparent so we can restore accountability and stability to government finances. Currently, our revised deficit is closing in on $2 billion. This is unprecedented and corrective action needs to be taken. The choices ahead of us will not be easy. Addressing our new fiscal reality is a top priority for our government. It is important for us to give the information to the people as they need to understand our baseline and our current circumstances. The reality we are facing now is that offshore oil royalties are expected to be less than half of the $1.2 billion budgeted. Total production is expected to decrease by 15 million barrels lower than the budget forecast. And the average oil price is $14 lower than budgeted. And we continue to see volatility based on the geopolitical environment. Other important factors include corporate income tax revenue is expected to decrease by 103 million compared to the budget forecast partially due to lower than anticipated corporate profits and the impact of the changing global environment around oil prices. We have adjusted the sales tax revenue that was budgeted <coughs> in the spring of this year to reflect our government's commitment to cancel the January 1st planned two point, uh, two point HST increase. Mining taxes and royalties are expected to de decrease by about $55 million over the budgeted forecast <clears throat> due to a significant downturn in nickel prices and continued weakness related to iron ore prices. And government business enterprise revenue are anticipated to degree, decrease by over $46 million compared to budget. This is a result of lower NALCOR net income. Like the province, NALCOR's financial results are being challenged by lower oil production and lower oil prices. Net debt has increased by over $900 million this year compared to what was budgeted by the previous administration. The simple explanation of net debt is total debt, less cash on hand. Our debt consists of borrowing and pension liabilities, while our cash and assets include loans and equity investments. So why is net debt important? Understanding debt carried by an organization like the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, is key to gaining insight into its financial health. And we want to be financially healthy. Net debt, as of March 31st, 2016, is now projected to be $12.4 billion. If left unchecked, 
net debt is projected to grow to $23 billion by 2020-21. So let's just put that in context. Including this fiscal year, the current path will have us borrow $15.4 billion. That means borrowing over $7 million a day for six years, close to $300,000 an hour, essentially a new home mortgage every hour of every day till 2021, or even simpler. Think about it as maxing out your $5,000 credit card limit every day, every hour, every minute for the next six years. As finance minister, I have a responsibility with my cabinet colleagues led by the premier to provide strong financial management, but we also must ensure strategic fiscal policy. And our economy is not performing as it was expected to perform when the previous government announced its budget. This is because of our province's heavy reliance on oil as an export revenue. The reality is that today the expectation is GDP growth is slower, capital investments are lower, and housing starts are down, just to name a few. Oil forecasting is an important financial principle for government. And as we've seen, oil prices have been very volatile since the middle of October, with the price ranging from about $48 U.S. a barrel to a low of $36.29 U.S. on December the 17th. And I believe, if I checked my email correctly, it was trading around $36 this morning. $36.49 to be exact. In addition to the uncertainty of the short and medium term impacts of global oil supply, there is a particularly high level of uncertainty about where oil prices are going over the short term as well as where the price will be for the next five years. There is currently a significant and prolonged oversupply of world oil keeping oil prices in a low range. Most forecasters now suggest that low oil prices will be the reality for a longer period of time. Brent has averaged $52.50 U.S. a barrel to date for fiscal 2015-2016. But during the latter part of April to the end of June 2015, Brent was selling in the mid to low $60 U.S. a barrel range. However, since July, Brent has been on a general decline. Coupled with low prices, supply has outmatched demand. We are aware of the significant impact volatile commodity prices can have on our revenues. And as you've seen, deterioration in oil prices and production has resulted in the deficit growing to about $2 billion. Our updated assumptions for the average annual oil prices will be $48 in the year ending March 2016, $51 for the year ending March 2017, $61 for the year ending March 2018, and $66 for the year ending March 2019. $69 for the year ending March 2020, $73 for the year ending March 2021. These assumptions are lower than the assumptions of the previous administration. And I would remind you that they forecasted 62, 71, 80, 84, 87, and 90. When deciding what oil prices to use for forecasting, the department consults with 11 forecasters. And I myself, as minister, have personally contacted several of the major banks since taking over the portfolio. And Minister Cody and I 
also met with Nalcor leadership to discuss their oil pricing assumptions. There have been a number of issues that have occurred this year since budget 2015, or since the 2015 oil royalty forecast was prepared, that have negatively affected production, including production is down at Hibernia, Terra Nova, and White Rose, with Hibernia experiencing the largest decline followed by Terra Nova. While the forecast reflects increases in oil production, over the next five years, more production does not necessarily mean higher royalties. There are a number of other factors that influence the amount of royalties collected. Obviously, the price of oil is an <coughs> important factor, as is the exchange rate. But another important factor is what oil field the production is coming from. For instance, in 2020-21, Hebron production is expected to represent approximately 40% of total production in that year. However, at, the, at that time, Hebron will not yet be paying out high royalty rates, as is being collected from the mature oil fields that we see today, which are paying out much higher royalty rates now. At the forecasted price assumptions, Hebron is not expected to reach simple payout until 2023, where the basic royalty rate will go from 1% to 5%. When it comes to key economic assumptions, the story the previous administration told during the budget is now very different. The export sector is negatively impacted by lower oil production. For the year as a whole, final real domestic demand is expected to be down from 2014, while real, real gross domestic product, GDP, is forecasted to decline by 2.6 percent due to lower exports. In 2017 and 2018, economic growth is expected to be constrained by declines in capital investment and lower employment from completion of large-scale projects. There has been detailed analysis <clears throat> and ministerial oversight on the revenue, on the expense, net debt, boring calculations, and assumptions contained in this fiscal forecast. Our government has talked to economists, forecasters, and other experts for advice and guidance. Even up until yesterday afternoon, as I attended meetings in Ottawa with other finance ministers from the provinces and the territories. We work towards providing the people of the province with an open and transparent view of the difficult fiscal reality facing this province. It is important for us to identify associated risks. As a result of this work, changes to the assumptions were made. These changes were made to ensure the framework paints a more realistic picture of the financial difficulties the province must face. Openness and transparency is critical <coughs> as we move forward together to meet these fiscal challenges head on and create a more sustainable future. Some of those changes include reversal of the planned increases to the HST and HST credit, lowering of oil royalty forecasts, and adjustments to Nalcor's net income reflecting the further drop in oil prices and production. So what does all this mean? compared with what you were told by the previous administration during budget 2015. You were told that the province was on track to meet 24 of 25 performance indicators over the next five years. The harsh reality is if we do nothing, only one of the 25 indicators will be met. 
a failing grade. You were told boring was a shor of short-term nature and that they would only borrow for operations in 2015-16. The reality is, as a government, we will have to borrow at least $1 billion for each of the next five years just for the operations and debt servicing if we do nothing. Total required borrowing will be $15.4 billion to 2020-21. That means borrowing over $7 million a day, as I said earlier, every day for six years. As Premier Ball has indicated, our province is facing a very difficult fiscal reality. A reality left unchecked will worsen. In consultation with Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, we will complete our due diligence and create a plan to deal with these challenges <coughs> as we prepare Budget 2016. This is a difficult fiscal reality and we are going to have to work together to correct the course. We will be working hard to maintain our credit ratings and we will be accountable and transparent for the choices we have to make. We will provide the stronger leadership and better management that we promised the people of the province. And we will get this under control. The situation is difficult, but not impossible. I have tremendous faith in the people of the province, our Premier, and my Cabinet and caucus colleagues to deliver our promise of a stronger, stronger fiscal management. And I'll now ask the Premier to provide further remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister. <clears throat> so you have now heard our physical situation is not an easy one. And we need to approach it with the same sense of urgency that it requires. That's why we're here today, just a few days before Christmas, delivering news that is not without doubt. It's difficult to hear. But it's also why we're here to explain where our plan of action begins. In the first three months of 2016, we will be working together with key stakeholders and the people of the province to inform budget 2016, 2017, so that we can put in place a strong long-term financial planning for our province. It's a foundation for our future. In the meantime, given the significant increase in the current year, deficit. Our government has decided to implement a number of immediate measures that will help us begin to mitigate some of the physical impacts that we're currently facing. Effective immediately, the following measures will be put in place. A comprehensive review of Muskrat Falls. We announced this yesterday with EY. We'll undertake a review of the project cost schedule and any associated risks so that we can take corrective action if required. Restricted hiring. This is not a hiring freeze, but a requirement for departments, agencies, boards, and commissions across government to assess all ongoing staffing actions and defer those that will not impact critical operations. These are not layoffs. All discretionary spending will be suspended. Departments and ABCs, these are the agencies, boards, and commissions must refrain from incurring expenditures of discretionary nature, including those costs that could otherwise be transferred from within existing uh, available funds. Savings will be redirected. Departments and ABCs are not permitted to reprofile any savings for the purposes of funding initiatives that are not included in Budget 2015. Any exceptional circumstances will be advanced for consideration by Treasury Board. The use of consultants will be restricted. Departments and ABCs are to review existing consulting contracts, uh, contracts and assess if there are any ability to terminate the contract at work. They will be asked to also review plans to hire consultants and access whether the work can be deferred or performed using internal staff resources. As an example, much of the work that we would see done today would something that would be done
by external consultants. But we've had the expertise with inside government to do this, and all of this information that we have here today has been, has been prepared by our own staff. All non-essential travel will be discontinued. However, essential work-related travel or travel related to federal, provincial, territorial meetings will be permitted. It's important for me to be clear the fact that these immediate actions do not include early retirement measures for public service. While these immediate actions are a start, we will need to work together to do much more. If we do nothing to address the significant deficit projections, our program expenses will keep growing and our debt expenses will continue to rise. If we do nothing, our deficit will remain over a billion dollars for the next five years and we will have to continue to borrow at much higher rates. I can assure you that we are not providing this outlook to cause upset or fear. We are laying it out publicly because we want to be honest with you and we believe that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have a right to know. But also so that we can begin the dialogue to enable us to move ahead. This is not only vital information for our government as we head into a budget process. This is also important for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to consider so we begin our pre-budget consultations and have a conversation about how we tackle this problem together. The fiscal update shows us the status quo is not feasible and we must make changes. So I'd like to encourage all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to get involved in the process. Challenges for us as a province, there are nothing new. So let's participate in these pre-budget pre consultations and let's share your ideas. Because we have important decisions to make as a government, we want to be accessible and accountable to you. Our next steps will include developing a strong multi-year fiscal strategy, working with financial advisors and rating agencies, engaging with you, our key stakeholders, starting a tax review so we can simplify the system, putting in place multi-year funding targets with a line-by-line -line review of departments and ABCs. And so really this is once again about reestablishing our baselines, and most importantly, engaging with the public service. I appreciate the confidence Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have placed in my government as we acknowledge and begin to address the difficult fiscal reality that we now face. But I'm equally confident with public support and meaningful engagement with business, labor, and communities that we will make the right decisions together. Our way forward will begin with strong leadership, and strong fiscal management, something that we need now more than ever. I realize and recognize that today's news conference is difficult. Today's news is not always easy to take, but it's not insurmountable. I have never backed down, and neither of the colleagues that we have in Cabinet, have, we have never backed down because things were just not easy. And the people of this province, they will not back down either. It just means that we will take the time to work together and rise again to the occasion. So I want to thank you for coming out today. Thank you for those that, have, that are viewing. And especially thank you to Minister Bennett and the staff. And we will now take questions from the media. Premier, in these projections, you, you've obviously calculated in the revenue that you're taking from the HST increase cancellation. <coughs> Does the previously announced attrition plan factor into this, this $300 million or so in savings that the previous government was counting on? Is that part of this or is that, that, been, is, part of that is part of it? So this pretty grim fiscal picture includes that previously announced downsizing of the civil service. It does. $300 million over, over the five, four, years. five years. So you promised no layoffs, no cuts uh, as a way of dealing with the deficit during the election. Given the numbers we're seeing here now with these updated projections and the debt potentially growing to $23 billion by the end of the decade, how can you possibly keep that promise? Well, first of all, the change is what you see, as we've always said, there would be a, an open dialogue and consultations with public service. But what we see right now, 
with internal, internally within government, we see a number of retirements and just natural changes. This represents about 3% of the public service per year. So there will be opportunities to actually make some changes within the public service, but this will all occur in consultations uh, with our uh, with our frontline workers. But those retirements, wouldn't they have already been factored into the attrition plan as they would be the natural turnover of governments would be part of that? I mean, the, what you've laid out here today seems to require a little bit more than minor surgery here. And what we're giving today, uh, David, is a, is a mid-year update. And as we move forward into the budget consultations, <coughs> it will include a lot of conversations with our public service and with our labor leaders and with our uh, own administration with inside government. But can you possibly keep that election promise? It seems you know, very difficult given what you just laid out. It's, you know, there's no question today's situation is a difficult one. And, but it starts with engagement and that's the, that's the level of consultations that we will have as we prepare for budget 2016 and 17 and make the, uh, the put in, in place the financial plan for the next uh, four years. Are you still going to build a new Waterford Hospital and Cornerbrook Hospital with these numbers? We've already said that we would look at a number of options that we have available to when it comes to infrastructure and one of the things that we want to consider would be the uh, performance-based infrastructure as we talked. Uh, you know, replacing infrastructure in our province, even in difficult times, is something that, you know, that would need to be done. Even within our own, uh, within the, the numbers that we put up today, you will see money allocated for infrastructure. So we're going to go through that exercise, you know, we'll see what options we have available. It's always, you know, an analysis and a value for money analysis that we've always said, and that will be shared with the people of the province, you know, but, uh, you know, our physical situation right now is the number one priority for us as a government. And those infrastructure decisions, you know, we'll go through that exercise. It doesn't mean the province shuts down. There's the infrastructure replacement that we will need in a number of key areas. And certainly the Waterford and the Cornwall Hospital are considerations, you know, that we'll have to make. So, so the decision is not made on those yet. You have to go through that process. We will go through that process, put the information out there. And as I know, these are, as you know, these are old, uh, inf this is old infrastructure right now. So we will meet up to those commitments, lay, lay, it, uh, lay it out there and look at what our options are. But, uh, sorry, I just need to, I need to have some clarity here and uh, follow up on my question. You said during the campaign, no layoffs. Is that still an active promise? Can that possibly be an active promise given the new updated numbers? You know, what we're looking at here today is we, we, we're standing by the commitment that we made to the people of the province right now. We will go through the budget exercise over the next you know, three months uh, with an engagement within public sector and we're going to be looking for, we look for efficiencies within the system uh, but understanding that those services are provided by the key, by ma in many cases by our key public sector uh, uh, workers and the engagement of our organized with labor and our own staff is critical at this important uh, time in in, uh, in in our province. But Minister Ben, if you're going to reduce costs, salaries are the single biggest way to do it in in government. I mean, that's the vast majority of what you spend your cash on. So, I mean, <coughs> can you possibly get this back to a balanced budget? Do you have a target year for a balanced budget? And you, can you possibly do that without a significant reduction in the public payroll? So I think the uh, target uh, for uh, when we will eliminate the deficit um, is going to have to come out of the consultations and the discussion, the budget planning that we have, the multi-year fiscal uh, strategy that we're going to put in place as part of the next budget. Um, when it comes to um, you know the, the attrition program, one of the things I think that um, is important to understand is the number of people that are retiring in the public sector is also uh, quite significant. We have um, opportunities we have opportunities and risks associated to labor force management inside our public sector that it is important for us to manage and I expect that uh, we'll you know be having really um, important conversations with our labor uh, representatives in the new year um, and getting a deeper understanding it with the with our uh, government officials on the full scope of staffing, training, and retention plans. So does that mean you could grow the attrition program beyond what was previously announced by the previous government? Because it seems like your best option to reduce your salary scale without giving someone a facelift. I think that all those conversations are going to be had in January. Today is about making sure that we provided the information to the people of the province as we know it today on the fiscal situation. Um, those questions will come when we have uh, the remainder of our due diligence done and we can provide information on the, uh, the staffing uh, complement we have in the public sector. Well, given the sheer size of the debt numbers that you're projecting here by 2020, 2021, how prudent was it to actually cancel that HST increase? Because that's a couple hundred million dollars a year. Okay. I mean, that's a billion dollars over five years that uh, 
you've taken out of your revenue streams? Well, it's interesting. Yesterday I had the opportunity to attend the uh, Federal, Provincial, Territorial Finance Ministers in Ottawa, and we had a, a presentation from the Bank of Canada. Um, and one of the discussions we had as part of that uh, discussion as a group is how important it is for governments uh, who are uh, working with economies that may be under distress or may be uh, experiencing some of the ramifications of the oil price that we have, that they are very careful about not only their um, you know, fiscal policy, um, but that they take into account how their decisions impact how money is going to move around the economy. And when we announced that we were going to uh, not uh, implement and we were going to cancel the previous administration's plan to increase the HST, we were clear from the get-go that it was about protecting uh, the economy because we anticipated that there was going to be a period of time where the economy needed to have, um, we needed not to create any more contractions than were already being uh, created. If you look at this though and where things are going to go, it seems like a credit rating downgrade of some sort is practically unavoidable at this point. I mean, have you had conversations with your key bond raters since you've been in office and what are they telling you about this? Because when you look at this, you're going to miss all of the benchmarks that they sort of wanted you to hit yeah. uh, in a pretty spectacular fashion. Well, I think there's a lot of experience at this table and at our cabinet table um, in dealing with um, uh, bond rating agencies, credit rating agencies, and lenders. And one of the things I can certainly say, and I've said in my comments, is we're going to do everything that we can to protect and preserve the credit rating that we have now. What about uh, collective bargaining with the unions? Should they expect a wage freeze? We will. That's what we've committed to, is a fair negotiated process. And this is a discussion that, uh, Matter of fact, I've had some conversations early on with some labor leaders, and you know the minister will be, uh, you know, will start a very uh, open dialogue with all our uh, labor leaders early in the new year. They need to be involved in this process, as as do many members of the communities. And there's lots of people uh, coming together. Well, actually, this is where the solutions will come from. And going back, you know, to some of the comments that, you know, this problem is significant enough that it's not going to be solved by cuts. We're going to need to look at new sources of revenue. We will need to look at engagement with as many people as we can find. And so, and of course, borrowing for the next, uh, you know, few years is, you know, you, when you look at the, the significance of this problem, and these are the, these are the realities that we have here. So this is our mid-year update, and, you know, we look forward to that engagement over the next, you know, three, four months as we prepare for our next budget. Of course, in preparation for that is what we see with the infrastructure spend coming out of, out of the federal government, and you know the minister had some conversations about this yesterday. I had a brief call this morning about where we position ourselves in taking opportunity, taking the best opportunity uh, to access this infrastructure money is important and critical to us, for us as well. But given these numbers, should the unions expect now that any kind of wage increase is not realistic? What the what the unions can expect, or anyone in this province can expect, with us is fairness and a fair negotiation and an opportunity for some meaningful, authentic dialogue into all of this, all of these challenges, because they impact all of us. You know, our, our public sector unions and, and, and leaders are Newfoundlanders and Labradorians just like I am. So it will be meaningful, authentic engagement and a fair negotiated process. I mean, what's happening in the offshore? Why, why is it 15 million barrels of oil less than what they have projected? Well, you know, there's a uh, there's a number of things in each and every field when you when you go and you look at the the impacts that we're seeing there. There's uh, there's there's just many answers to that. If you look at Ibernia as an example, and the Ibernia South, you know what's impacting them is very different than what would impact you know other fields. But you know one thing about that with the production down, the good news and the silver lining in that would tell me that it's still in the ground and it's still of value. So at some point that will come out and and the benefit will be there for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Are the companies cutting back production because of the prices? I, that's not the message that I've gotten, that there's a deliberate uh, cutback in production. That's not <coughs> what I've seen at all. It's just some of the complexities around uh, you know, what's happening in the operations of the field. But uh, that's, that's the only message that I know right now. But as I said, <coughs> the key thing is, is that resource is still available to us. And we must not forget that you know, as a province, and I keep saying this, is that you know, when you look at it, the balance sheet of Newfoundland and Labrador is very strong. We have a lot of key assets that we can build on, but we have a very short midterm problem, very significant right now, that we have to bridge our way through. So this is where the, the key management in all of this, and this is the reason why I'm not willing to give up. And this is the real, I'm sure, uh, I can assure you that our cabinet's not willing to give up. Uh, we do have a, the long-term prognosis for our province is good, is solid, 
but we've got a very we've got a midterm uh, problem right now that is very significant. But what wins out in the decision making process? Avoiding that credit rating upgrade and what's going to be a period of fairly significant borrowing, or keeping your promise on no cuts and no layoffs, because the short term political promise versus the long term consequence of a credit rating upgrade. What's your bigger priority there? And when you when you look at uh, where we are today, if you look at the slide that we've just shown you about just over $7 billion in, uh, in, in revenue and about $1.4 billion, I think, in the last year of, uh, of, uh, of debt, uh, that will, uh, I mean, that's about 20 percent. So you know that, you know, the, this is not an easy picture to paint, but keep in mind what I, just, what I said earlier, cutting your way out of this problem is not necessary. That's not the solution. We had to grow revenue as well, and we, uh, we need to make sure that, you know, that we get a good understanding of where our assets will be. But to get out of the problem, you've got to grow the revenue by $10 billion mm -hmm. over five years. I mean, yeah. that's, if that was easy, governments would have done it long ago. Absolutely. And I understand that. And it, it, there, is, there are long-term solutions to this. There's no quick fix to this. I think everyone that's watching this presentation today, they will understand this, that there's going to be borrowing you know, for a period of time here. And uh, yet, we still have a strong balance sheet, which is important. What do you think this will have? Uh, from a confidence perspective on consumers in the province, do you think this will impact, uh, you know, uh, consumer good sales? Well, what I see here today is is really just just honesty in putting the correct information as we know it, putting that out there uh, to the people in our province, and we've seen <coughs> the economy in our province perform uh, in, in many ways. So, really, right now, it's the business of government. Uh, that's uh, it's under a lot of pressure right now, but we have a lot of businesses that are operating, uh, you know, within the community that are doing okay, and we need to find a way now that so we can marry the two, and so that we can secure our future. We've heard the just, phrase. Uh, sorry, just on that one, uh, to add to what the premier said, um, we still have the second highest household income in Canada. Um, you know, there's a difference between uh, fiscal management in the context of government and what impact that has on. The uh, you know the the money that flows in the economy, and what uh, consumers do based on how they're feeling about their own income, um, and it's something that we have to make sure that we look at and consider as we do things like uh, the uh, tax reform that was uh, you know was mentioned earlier. We've heard the phrase previous administration a lot here this afternoon. How much of this is an exercise in being able to blame some of the future tough decisions on the previous uh, PC administration? None of it. This is about putting out information that we, uh, we've, we've just gotten. We've been privy to this information, uh, well, less than a week now since the Cabinet's been sworn in, and we've, we've said from day one that we would put this out on um, either the 21st or the 22nd of December. It would have been out yesterday, but the Finance Minister had a, a meeting in Ottawa that was important for her to attend. Uh, so it, it's, it's out there now. This is not about you know, coming out today and, and blaming anyone. This is really about a call of action for all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to work with us in finding a way forward. Now, Minister, did you get any sense in your trip to Ottawa about more transfers from the federal government that could help the province's bottom line? Well, I think that we had conversations about uh, the federal government's uh, plans around the infrastructure uh, you know, plan that they've underway or that they're beginning to you know, put together. Uh, we had discussions around the, uh, the Canada Child Benefit which, you know, for us here in our economy, it's going to be a good news story. You know, lots of families who haven't been able to, uh, you know, are going to benefit from that uh, financial plan, and it'll uh, be able to take a lot of young kids out of poverty that are in poverty now. Um, and that will push money into the economy, new money into the economy, which will be good for us. Um, you know, certainly, as the Premier has already mentioned, the infrastructure uh, spending is an important part of, you know, we our work that we do now so we can be ready for those conversations at the federal table. Uh, the, the, everything hasn't been fully formed uh, by the federal government yet and they're very open to feedback from the provinces and the territories and we're looking forward to being, you know, participating in that dialogue. I wanted to ask quickly about housing starts. Is there a significant dif difference there between what was expected and, and what you're ultimately looking at now? Um, do you have a sense if that's entirely attributable to that larger economic picture, or what explanation is there for that change? Yeah, I mean, the one comment I'll make to, uh, to that, when I got a chance to see the context of the economic indicators across the country, some of what we are seeing in our province in Newfoundland and Labrador is um, consistent with some of the indicators that are happening in other uh, resourced 
based and resource reliant provinces like Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, you know, Saskatchewan, as an example, has done a lot of work uh, to diversify its economy and hasn't had the same <coughs> hasn't had the same results, uh, hasn't had the same risks, I guess, associated with what's going on with the oil price. And that's one of the reasons why we've we've talked about and the premier just mentioned it about why it's important for us to look to diversify our, our revenue uh, mix, and it's important for us to put a lot, as much effort into growing the revenue as we would put into, you know, uh, assessing where we're spending money. Um, and I th would hope that the process we're going to go through with our, you know, our deputy ministers, the public sector uh, leadership and management, including the unions, uh, would allow us to unlock innovation. I mean, I, I met earlier today with the deputies, and one of the things that we certainly uh, challenge them to do over the Christmas season is, you know, let's let's get that creative energy that is so well known in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, all ready with the best thinking, the best ideas. Because sometimes it's not about uh, the obvious. Sometimes it's more about the things that you know haven't been talked about yet. And I think that you know we already are hearing some exceptional ideas and innovation that we're looking at, including and talking about as part of our budget process. Right, but it's not as though the last government didn't attempt some forms of diversification of the economy. And we saw investments into everything, from, you know, cranberries, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, like, where are you seeing this diversification happening? Where are you seeing, what sectors even are you? Well, one, of the, one of the things that we talked about yesterday as, as uh, finance ministers was the need to make sure that um, in areas where there are, uh, you know, already uh, eked out opportunities, uh, where there's already uh, export markets uh, developed, how can you further enhance those export uh, markets to increase the volume of things you're exporting? Because the trick is you got to bring more money in, right? So we need our business communities, to, our business community in particular, to be looking at ways of becoming competitive um, in exports, um, and that's something that uh, you know we think we need to you know put some focus on. Well, if there's no more questions, thank you, and I can thank you for coming out. And this will be my last opportunity in this forum to uh, wish everyone a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, we look forward to uh, back at it uh, earlier than anticipated, for sure. So thank you once again, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in the new year.